How many here know what the word fuzz mean or fuzz testing? Okay, good enough. So um, I copy pasted some language from Wiki Wikipedia. The, um, the TLDR is that fuzz testing is all about using random input and um, monitoring your code. Uh, how many here have used the Go coverage tool? Like to see, okay, you can imagine as if something was throwing random data at your code and look at the coverage. And as long as your code gets covered a little bit more for every new input, it saves it and says, okay, I know this like um, enlightened a little bit more code. I can explore a little bit more and keeps doing that and keeps trying random things until it covers, well, as much as it can. Why? So um, how many here don't write tests? I like, I like the YOLO approach. So um, um, everyone should write tests um, unless you are really writing just scripts. And sometimes I find scripts easier to test with tests. Um, when I write tests, I usually work under some assumptions. Those assumptions are always there. When you write code, they are with you because they make you faster. You have biases. And those biases are going to make your code uh, faster to write, easier to read. Problem is that you also have those assumptions when you write tests. And those assumptions might not hold true for all inputs. And it turns out that, unsurprisingly, that humans are horrible at finding those assumptions and break them down when they write tests. Um, if you don't trust me on these, uh, there are studies, but I think the most important value is that um, in Google we use fuzzing everywhere. And we find hundreds of bugs in all open source and internal libraries because we have our developers write their own fuzz targets. And I'll get into detail later. And if you don't trust me on this, you can go to the open source package that I am going to list later. And you can see that at the end of the readme, there is a very long list of all the bugs that were found by GoFuzz and they were fixed. And some of those are vulnerabilities. So you might want to check that out. So in order, to use fuzzing is not, use fuzzing is not as easy as using tests. But if your code is easy to test, it's usually decently doable to fuzz it. Um, if your code is not easy to test, uh, but if it is, um, there are a little bit more um, things that you should keep in mind. Uh, code that is meaningful to fuzz is code that might get some unexpected input. So if you expose something on the internet, or if your user are able to provide some data, or if you are able to provide some data in a configuration, you don't want to, your servers to just go down because you mistyped a config. So anything that takes input is basically worth fuzzing target. But you should make sure that the parsing part, so the code that gets exposed to that input is decently easy to test by itself. So that you don't expose too much code necessarily uh, in that API. So it should be easy to mock or like remove all the parts that you don't want to test. Um, the setup, setup code for your targets should be easy. So if you need to bring up an entire HTTP server to just run a string, um, might get slow and expensive to fuzz. And at the same time, you shouldn't have a package-wide state. Um, you shouldn't have that anyways but especially for fuzzing that can create irreproducible uh, crashes. And if your crashes are not reproducible, um, well, there are two things that are gonna happen. GoFuzz is going to retry and check, oh, that failed. Maybe my previous finding wasn't that good, so it's not going to surface it. And if it does surface it, you're not gonna be able to test why your code crashed. So basically you have this feeling that something is wrong with your code and you know what, and you're like, uh, I don't know, but I don't know about you, but it makes me, mm, gives me a problem to have that kind of code. Now, writing the fuzz function. Um, as for tests, fuzz is similar. You have to write a function that fuzzes your code. The function has a well-defined signature for now, so it takes a slice of bytes and returns an integer. 
you might want to pre-check some things in the inputs. For example, if you know that your parser crops the input at 500 bytes, it doesn't make sense to fuzz with arbitrary long slices. So you can just like crop it and say and tell the fuzzer, um, I don't care if it is longer than this. Um, but after that, there are a couple more things that you should do. The input of your function, if it is not a slice of bytes, if it is a string or if it is other things, you need to mangle the input and make it so it's um, very straightforward to take an input from the fuzzer and turn it into the object that was passed as input to the um, function want to fuzz. For example, let's say you have a struct that contains an int. You get a slice of bytes in input. You should make it easy for the fuzzer to find out what happens to make that an int. So for example, you can use the math um, binary package to just take four bytes from that slice, turn them in an int, and use that as a struct field. But it should be very straightforward to turn the input into a struct. Then most people stop here. I've seen a lot of fuzzing targets in the, in the wild, and people say, OK, I feed this input, I call my function, doesn't crash, good. It doesn't end there. Uh, that is very, well, sometimes you can find crashes in that way, and if you do, oof, your code is going to give you some headache to fix. But if you don't, it doesn't mean your code is fast correctly. You should take the return value of your functions and poke at it, like check if some invariants are uh, still true. Some things that you would never expect to become false became true for some reasons. I can give you an example. You parse an incoming HTTP request, and you find out that there is a host destination different from the host that you are, and you shouldn't accept that. And why did it get so far that the request was successfully passed, accept by your firewall, accept by your checks, and just is there? So you should check the outcome. And if something is wrong, panic. And um, I like this because I never get to use panic in Go. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a useful feature now. Um, then you get to return three possible values. It's zero if the input wasn't very meaningful. For example, you pass it to the parser, the parser returns an error and a nil value, and you're like, meh. I mean, good to know this input is invalid, but it doesn't really give me much. So in that case, you just return zero. If it was parsed successfully, so if some code was executed, some meaningful code was executed, you return one. Minus one is almost never used, but if you want to make sure that um, some input will not be added to the corpus, I will explain this later. Um, even if they uh, discovered some new code, so like, I really don't care about this kind of input, you will return minus one. So you can guide the fuzzer through discovering your code in a, a cooperative way. Here is an example of, of a fuzz target. Um, this is a gopher that is willing to crash. So you take the input, you transform it somehow, you call your fuzz function, which is in this case fuzz target, if something unexpected happened, you panic. If it is relevant, irrelevant, you return one. If it is useless, you return minus, minus one. Otherwise, you return zero. Um, this seems pretty simple, but uh, it's not that easy to get right, especially first times. Um, most of the time, you will end up panicking too much. And I mean, that's not very valuable. Um, as I said, you have to check many things. This is just an example. Uh, there's a link to these slides uh, that you can go to, which is uh, clap.page.link slash gofuzz. It's linked at the end. And this is just a list of things that uh, you should care about. For example, um, when you optimize your functions, and this helped us finding a bug in the JSON package before 1.13 was released. If you're optimizing a package, keep the old implementation. The non-optimized implementation is simpler to check. It's simpler to write. So FUDs your new implementation and your old implementation and check if the outcome is the same. If they give you different results, your optimization is not invariant in the features. So it's observable. And if an, um, an optimization is observable, it's wrong, usually. I mean, you can observe the execution time, but that's good. That's the only thing that should change. So in this case, the JSON package was misquoting some strings. And this was found by fudging by compiling two different versions of the same function and just finding out what were the differences. And this got caught, I think, the day before the release, which was fun, because otherwise it would have been nasty to fix afterwards. But it got 20% faster, so good. 
one thing that a lot of people um, forget about is cleanup. If you shut down a server, or if you shut down something, or you clean up a struct, at the end it should be cleaned. So if you fuzz and you find out that something is dirty after the fuzzing, might want to check into it. Um, so if you have a complex format, there is a directory that you can pre-fill with some data to help the fuzzer get started. I'll, I'll get to this later, um, but don't overdo it. Um, I've seen a lot of people just taking megabytes of data inside this directory and say, OK, fuzz like this. And the fuzzer goes like, yay, this is going to take 124 years to find something. Um, I mean, if you have time and a lot of hardware, you can do it, but do not overdo it. It's as simple as that. I know this is not standard packages, and this is not um, even remotely user friendly, but <sighs> so the way it works right now is that we're discussing if it is worth uh, bringing this in the standard Go command. So as you do Go test, have a Go uh, either go test and then, as you would do with benchmarks, go test fuzz, and or directly go fuzz. And it would be nice to have it built in. It's not yet. Um, this is a, a very well polished package. Works very well. You can trust this. And um, I mean, it's used by many many different projects, including the standard library. So it's a reliable package to depend on. Now. Once you run it the first time, you will see like found 124 crashes in the first run. And you might think, good, not good, because you have to look into them. And also, coverage. Um, I'll be doing some live coding, and I will show you how to fuzz a small function. If coverage gets too big, and if a number coverage gets above 5,000, you got something wrong. You're fuzzing at too big of an API, because uh, to be efficient, it uses a fixed hash map to check the coverage of your code. And above that number, some lines will start to collide. So at that point, fuzzing becomes really random. And I don't know if you want to waste CPU power on that. If you exhaust your memory, buy more or reduce the amount of workers. It's just a command line flag. Now I'll take a look at some code. And um, hmm, this was unexpected. Let's see if I can fix this. Um, well, stuff happened. Good enough. So uh, can you all read this code? Is it readable from the back? Larger. I can make this larger. So today I'm going to show you, today I'm going to show you a very simple package. Uh, it's called simple and exposes two functions, read number and write number. Uh, the way this works is that um, it takes an integer, is it, or it takes a string, and gives you the best it can do as an integer representation of it. So it just uh, calls str conv, and if there is an error, it returns to zero, which is a good assumption. I mean, PHP does that all the time, and stuff's, <laughs> the world is on fire yet. So, I mean, it's doable. And um, I mean, I said it's simple, okay? And then another function that allows you to take an integer and represent it back. This is easy, right? I mean, it's hard to get wrong. I even wrote tests, so this must be correct. And I will show you some assumptions. Um, if I give 42, should output 42? Pretty good. Um, if I give a string, just give me a zero. If I give a negative number, give me a negative number. Zero should still be zero. And this is like big brain time. And a float should still be a zero, because it's not a correct integer. I don't want to return a one in this case. Um, those tests pass. I also added a little bit more logic in my tests that I can show you, which is I read the number, I write the number back, and I check that they're both equal. So if the number is zero, of course, they're not going to be equal, the string and the other string, because I mean, unless it's exactly zero, they're going to be different. But I mean, I, I still check that deserializing and reserializing back is, um, stays invariant. Then 
and decided to write a FADS function for it. As I said, FADS, um, very simple, gives you a slice of bytes. And um, what can I do? If the, the value that I read is zero, uh, I don't really care. Because as I said, it's probably a string. Let's give some easy win to the fudger. This is not an interesting input. What else do you think should I check? What else would you check in this case? One thing is like check the same thing that I do in tests. It's not hard. So I just do this string is equal. Um, uh, yeah, this string is equals to um, simple. No, right, num. Num is just red. And I want to see if s is not. Um, so in this case, I know that I parsed the number. So I recognize this as valid. I returned an integer, and I'm writing it back. They should be identical. So in this case, I just do panic um, from the sprint um, got percent Q want percent Q. And here I'm just going to do like um, S and B. Pretty easy. And in this case, I'm going to return um, one. This is an interesting input because it allowed me to check all my functions and cover all my code. Um, now, to build this, I don't know if it will build. Probably there, are, I have a ton of typos. Um, I just call these two comments, and I run the fuzzer, and I have 73 crashes. So there are 73 inputs that this code found to not hold in my premise. It took. Three seconds. Um, I was writing this today, and I just realized I'm very bad at testing. So <laughs> I went back into the FADS directory, uh, and I have a crashers directory. Here, you get files based on the hash of the content. Now, let's take a look at the, at the input. 0403. I'm parsing integers, so the first leading zero is going to be dropped. So this is not an invariant, because my code will not preserve that 0. Let's take a look at something else. Uh, minus 04, yeah, the 0 after the minus is still a problem. And um, this number is too big, doesn't fit an int. First three crashes were completely different crashes that I didn't think about in testing. Took me three seconds to find with fuzzing. Um, once you get to this point, I mean, you fix your code, please, and, uh, and then you take these outputs and GoFuzz gives you three very useful things. The output of the program that crashed, in this case, I caused the panic. So this is pretty easy. But when your code panics, it's easy to have this log. And the quoted, the quoted output, the quoted input. Anyone wants to guess why? Mm, good one. And you want to see non-printable characters? They're, they're going to be escaped with a backslash x notation. One more reason. No, um, good thinking, but no. And that just used them in your tests. Exactly. If you didn't think about this in the first place, do you think that the person that is going to change this code next is going to think about it? Of course not. And that person will probably be you. So you want to make sure that you don't make the same mistake twice. Um, I've been bitten by these an infinite amount of times. So please, please um, add the output. Um, at the output to your tests. This is called preventing regression. And you should always, always make sure that you do that. Um, what we do usually um, is to have an automated system that reports those things. Um, GoFuzz is also pretty smart because it allows you to uh, um, unify some crashes. So it's instrumented in a way so that Two crashes are going to probably be executing a different code path. 
So it doesn't give you like all the numbers that starts with a zero. That would be insane. It, it helps you a lot. So when you get a quoted output from a fuzzer, there is probably going to be a good entry for your tests. You put that in your test and you fix the code, usually in this order. Um, the demo was, was already done. Um, I went a little bit fast, but I'm open to question. And this is a slide deck. There are a lot of suggestions in the slides and even in the comments. If you think this would be a useful addition to the standard library, um, there is an open issue that I linked in the, in the comments. Uh, please use fuzzing, use it for a while, report. Um, even if you use closed source code, it's fine. You just have to open a PR to the readme of GoFuds and say, I work for this company, we use fuzzing, we found three bugs, thank you. That helps us building a case to make this part of the standard library. Nothing ends up in the standard library or in the Go tools until we are sure that this, there is a good case for it. So please, please use it, fuzz it, break it, fix it, and report it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, for your example, how would you proceed with fixing those things? Fixing those problems. Yeah. Um, so, well, depends on what are your invariants. So if you decide to accept that um, a number uh, that starts with a zero can be represented back without the zero, um, you would take the fuzzing function and you would change it. So if the string starts with, uh, minus zero or zero, you just return zero. So you can do if byte starts with uh, byte has prefix uh, uh, minus zero or zero, you just return zero. And the fuzzer is going to pick up that it can still test negative numbers, just not the ones that starts with zero and so on. Uh, if instead you decide to keep holding your promise that something can be deserialized and reserialized back, then you change your code. And um, you can't preserve the zero information, so you have to reject the input as invalid. So you have to treat numbers that start with a zero, either as octal, or um, decide to reject it uh, altogether. I've found some funny bugs about uh, octal notation. So there were some crashes that would only crash at... Um... So I had a custom integration uh, tests running, and they were fail only at 8 a.m. Um, every day, reliably at 8 a.m. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I went back and I checked, okay, it was running every two hours. And of course, I was serializing strings and I love YAML. And YAML decided that, um, well, two, zero, two is two, zero, four is four. 0, 8 is invalid because octal numbers don't start to, don't, can't have the 8. And then at 10 o'clock, well, it's back to decimal. <laughs> and this is kind of stuff that you easily find with fuzzing. Because fuzzing is going to try all the numbers and it's going to tell you, hey, um, have you heard about the 0? <laughs> Any other questions? What do you mean? Because if you use Go... Yes, Alora. So, it's a problem. But to be honest, um, the time it takes to um, write the fuzz target and the energy that it takes to run the fuzzer uh, might make you want to um, write simple tools to still use GoPath for a while. Um, we are working, actively working on, make, on fixing this. Um, we're going to try it out for a while. Um, I, don't, I can't give you a timeline on that. Any other question? Do you recommend uh, putting a fast test into your CI system or would you recommend setting up a separate pipeline? Good question, amazing question. Uh, don't put this in your CI, ever. Um, uh, um, there are, so I don't want to advertise anyone, but it, if you search for stuff online, you can find, um, if your code is open source, you can find free fuzzing services. They support Go. There are at least two that I know of. They're pretty good. Um, as long as you, so you have to 
report which bugs they found, and that's what you have to pay. So if you have an open source package and you tell them, thanks to <clears throat> whatever fuzz, um, I was able to find these two bugs, and that is free. It works almost like a CI, so when you push a new change, uh, well, you can tell them, keep the corpus, throw away the corpus, there are setups, um, and that is, they work pretty well. I would personally not run this on an CI because it's expensive if it's not optimized for that. And plus, rebuilding, as was pointed out, rebuilding a target to be fast is easy if you're still on GoPath, but if you switch to modules, which you probably do if you use a CI or if you are sane, um, it's going to take a little bit more time. I saw there was another question somewhere. Oh, okay. Um, one more thing. Fuzzing is expensive. So um, do it wisely. I mean, it's not incredibly expensive. It's way more expensive to have a vulnerability exposed on the internet. But um, don't fuzz everything. It's not either a replacement for unit testing nor uh, something that you can apply everywhere. Apply it on the crucial points of input of your library. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.